in the Old Testament in the first book of Chronicles and we read chapter 10. I can't remember if we have spent two or three Sunday mornings looking at the first nine chapters of First Chronicles, eh, which contained largely lists of names. We have tried to discern and to learn from some of these names, and we have learned some fairly basic lessons with regard to Christian life and service. And the story goes on now with another very basic lesson in Christian life and service. First Chronicles chapter 10 at verse 1. Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. And the Philistines overtook Saul and his sons, and the Philistines slew Jonathan and Abinadab and Malchisua, the sons of Saul. The battle pressed hard upon Saul, and the archers found him, and he was wounded by the archers. Then Saul said to his armor-bearer, Draw your sword and thrust me through with it lest these uncircumcised Philistines come and make sport of me. But the armor-bearer would not, for he feared greatly. Therefore Saul took his own sword and fell upon it. And when his armor-bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell upon his sword and died. Thus Saul died. He and his three sons and all his house died together. And when all the men of Israel who were in the valley saw that the army had fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, they forsook their cities and fled, and the Philistines came and dwelt in them. On the morrow, when the Philistines came to strip the slain, they found Saul and his sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. And they stripped him and took his head and his armor and sent messengers throughout the land of the Philistines to carry the good news to their idols and to their people. And they put his armor in the temple of their gods and fastened his head in the temple of Dagon. But when all Jabesh Gilead heard all that the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and took away the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons and brought them to Jabesh. And they, <clears throat> and they buried their bones under the oak in Jabesh and fasted seven days. So Saul died for his unfaithfulness. He was unfaith <coughs> un <coughs> pardon me, unfaithful to the Lord in that he did not keep the command of the Lord and also consulted a medium seeking guidance and did not seek guidance from the Lord. Therefore, as a direct consequence, the Lord slew him and turned the kingdom over to David, the son of Jesse. Amen, and may God bless to our hearts the reading of his word and help us to learn the lesson from it. Now will you turn with me to the passage that we read earlier in the service, the tenth chapter of the first book of Chronicles, which chapter is really full of significant spiritual instruction. In our earlier Sunday morning studies in this book, we have reminded ourselves that the book of Chronicles, which is a survey of Israel's history, a selective study, because it doesn't contain everything that you have in the books of Samuel and Kings, and some of the accounts are different. The account of Saul's death here is different from 2 Samuel chapter 1. It is a selective story written for the benefit of the children of Israel, the Jews, when they returned from their 70 years' captivity in Babylon back 
to their own city of Jerusalem and to their own land of Judah. And so it is a survey of history that is written for the people of God at the beginning of a significant new stage in their life. It is a survey of Israel history and it is an assessment and an interpretation of that history from a spiritual and a moral standpoint rather than from an economic or a political standpoint. Now we recognize and we must always recognize that economic factors and political factors and climatic factors all operate in the affairs and destinies of nations. But this book of Chronicles insists that the basic key to history and the basic consideration is God, particularly in terms of God's dealings with men and with nations, and we forget that God does deal with men and nations. I hope you believe that. God's dealings with men and nations and God's dealings on the basis of their dealings with him. And God does deal with us and with nations on the basis of our dealings with him. There, there comes to mind a verse from Scripture, I forget the reference, where God says of his own people, I called to them and they would not hear. So now they call to me and I will not hear. And there are those who say, oh, oh, but God wouldn't say that. God has said that and it is recorded in Scripture. And so you see, we are dealing here, we are considering here in our studies in Chronicles, God's dealings with his people on the basis of his people's dealings with him. And of course it goes beyond God's immediate people and it involves all the nations. And I remind you of what the scriptures say. In the book of Proverbs chapter 14 at verse 34, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And therefore, if you, have an, if you have a nation that quite deliberately, as our nation has done, turns away from righteousness and from God's righteousness, then it is only natural to expect that that nation will decline. I remind you of another verse in Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 29 at verse 18, where there is no vision. That is, no vision of God, no vision of God's truth, no vision of God's dealings, and no visions of God's salvation and God's judgment. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Ah, you say, preacher, but what, a, what about the, mor the modern translation? Yes. Where there is no vision of God, the people cast off restraint. And this is why we are now living in a generation in our own land where, where anything goes and everything goes because God tends by and large not to be in all our thoughts. And so in this book of Chronicles, and we shall discover this as we go through the chapters, the Chronicles concern is not so much to record things that happened, but to record them in a way that signifies why they happened. And therefore he is selective in his history record, and he concentrates by and large upon the story of David, the king of Israel. And the purpose of all that we are reading and studying in Chronicles is to remind and to instruct and to encourage the returned exiles and, of course, ourselves as we stand facing the future and what God has prepared for us 
and what God has called us to be and to do in the future. And the purpose of the, the, these chapters, these stories in the Chronicles, is to enable us to set ourselves to face and to cope with the future service of God and to do this in the right way. And as history tells us, almost as soon as the exiles return from Babylon to Jerusalem and to Ju Judah, and almost as soon as the work of rebuilding the temple and the city walls began, as the story has it in Ezra and Nehemiah, as, that is, as soon as the people were set to go forward with God, there came outbursts of opposition. Sometimes sporadic outbursts of opposition, sometimes persistent attacks of terrible fierceness, and sometimes spells that couldn't really be described as conflict, but rather spells of long-term pressure in which the people of God were struggling. Now you may well say, well, preacher, against that kind of background and introduction, the book of Chronicles should have a great deal to say to us. And I believe that that is so. And the first thing to grasp as we come to this chapter, and we have it in the very first verse of the chapter, the first thing to grasp is the fact and the reality of the enemy. Now the Philistines fought against Israel. And the book of Chronicles reminds them long ago and us in our generation that right from the start and all along the Old Testament story of Israel, the people of God, you read it in Scripture again and again and again, the Philistines fought against Israel. Sometimes they are specifically named as the Philistines, sometimes other, other of the ethnic groups are incorporated with them. But again and again and again, right down through the story of the onward developing of the work of God, the truth was this, the Philistines fought against Israel. And this is a fact in the whole of the Old Testament. And people say, oh, well, but that, that's Old Testament. What about New Testament? Well, the same enmity of the powers of evil against the people of God and the work of God is seen in the ministry of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We take but one simple example from Matthew chapter 13, the story of the parable of the tares and the wheat. And that which was evil was sown amongst that which was good to confuse the whole issue. And as Jesus told the parable, he said, An enemy has done this. And later on, speaking to his disciples, as he prepared them for their future service, he said to them, Now, as my disciples, my servants, be, be quite clear about this. They persecuted me, they will persecute you. And when we move from the Gospels into the, into the Epistles, the Acts of the Apostles and the Epistles of the New Testament, you find the same record of the activity of the enemy against the people and the work of God, and you find it in the ministry and in the letters of Paul and of Peter and of James and of John. Now the Philistines fought against Israel. As if the chronicler is saying at the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, be absolutely clear about this. As you set yourself to go forward in obedience to God, your experience will be spiritual warfare. That's why we sang the hymn, Onward Christian Soldiers, Marching as to War. 
It is spiritual warfare. There is and there will always be an enemy. And as we've said so often from this pulpit over the years, we will never cope with our personal lives, our congregational life, the work of the gospel at home or the work of the gospel abroad, unless we face and grasp the fact of the reality of the enemy and we must expect battles and we must be prepared for battles. We must never be surprised by, nor should we ever be deterred by, the attacks of the enemy, whatever form they come in. I remind you of what Paul said towards the end of the sixth chapter of his letter to the Ephesians. He spoke there about the wiles of the devil. He spoke there of the stratagems, that is, the well-laid plans of the devil. And we need to recognize that the methods that the devil uses to attack us and to attack the work are absolutely legion. He is extremely inventive. And he watches with great care and with great accuracy the lives of individual believers and the life of congregations. And the moment he sees a chink in the armor, he will be on to it to seek to gain entrance and so to introduce confusion and distraction and hindrance to the work of God. Isn't, isn't there an occasion, is it in one of Paul's letters to the Corinthians? If I remember rightly, the context is particularly the context of human relationships. And Paul is telling the Christians to set a guard upon that area of their life lest Satan gain advantage. For we are not ignorant of his devices. And one of the things I think we need to keep very much in mind, perhaps two things, one of course is that the devil and all his kingdom has been decisively and completely conquered in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we stand in that victory. But the other thing we have to remember is this. That one victory over the enemy does not mean that he will stay away for good. I remind you of the word that is recorded. I don't think I've got it marked at the end of which verse, verse 13 I think of Luke's chap Luke chapter 4, the end of the story of the temptation of our Lord Jesus Christ, when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. J.B. Phillips' translation of that verse says that the devil departed from Jesus until his next opportunity. The New English Bible translates it that the devil departed from Jesus, biding his time. And we have to recognize that the devil being the kind of enemy that he is, he will always attack us where we are weak, not where we are strong. People sometimes say, oh, I, I stand four square upon the basic biblical fundamental doctrines of the gospel. Well, hallelujah if you stand there. I don't think, I don't think the devil will try to make you into a heretic. Although, mind you, I know and you know men who used to stand four square upon the biblical fundamentals of the gospel.
but they don't stand there anymore. The devil, I don't think, will try to make us heretics. I don't think he will try to cause us to abandon the faith when we stand there resolutely. But are there not other areas in our lives and our personalities where we are, to say the least of it, vulnerable? The Philistines fought against Israel. There is an enemy. The second thing we have to grasp from this chapter is that Israel, the people and the work of God, were defeated by the enemy. You have it in verse 1. The Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled before the Philistines. You have it recorded again in verses 7, 8, 9, and 10 of our chapter. When all the men of Israel who were in the valley saw that the army had fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, <coughs> they forsook their cities and fled. And the Philistines came and dwelt in... I wouldn't like Philistines to come and take possession of this church and congregation. And if the time should ever come that I go along our guile seat and see this building, and I'm not an idolater of buildings, but if I see it occupied by that which has no part at all in God or in his work, I think I would weep as I went along the street. But it's happened to many a church. And it happened here to the people of God. They were defeated. They were put to flight. And not only were they defeated, they were publicly shamed by the powers of evil and by the people of evil. And I think this is something that's very solemn indeed. And it is in this context that we are told of the death of Saul, the first king of Israel. A terrible end to a strange and a complicated life and character. Look at verse 13. I told you that the chronicle was concerned not only to record facts, but to interpret them. So Saul died for his unfaithfulness. He was unfaithful to the Lord in that he did not keep the command of the Lord, that is, he was disobedient, and also consulted a medium seeking guidance, not seeking guidance from God, not turning in the anguish of, of a crisis in his life to the God whose hand had been upon him for so long, but he turned to the powers of the occult, to the powers of evil, seeking guidance, and did not seek guidance from the Lord. Therefore, the Lord slew him. The Lord brought him to his death and turned the kingdom over to David, the son of Jesse. I say these are very solemn verses. They show to us a man who refused to do right by God. And if you have never been in that position, then you're entitled to point the finger of accusation and to throw the stones of judgment. But I don't know that any of us here this morning are entitled to point the finger or to speak the word of criticism or judgment. Here is a man who refused to do right by God. But I remind you that it was Israel's determination, that is, it was the determination of the people of God 
to have a king like other nations, a desire that was contrary to God's will, it was the determined carnal desire of the people of God that initially put Saul into the position of power and of danger. And that kind of thing still happens. And congregations can put ministers into places of immense spiritual danger if the congregation is not doing right by God. Saul was unfaithful. Saul was disobedient. There came a time in his life, I'm quoting from 1 Samuel chapter 26, in the story of a confrontation, a certain situation that involved David, and Saul, the king of Israel, publicly said, I have played the fool, I have erred exceedingly. But he didn't change. It was as if he said, oh, well, I I suppose I was wrong. But he still went on in the same direction. Oh, let us not point the finger. Uh, Could there not be, perhaps there are those here this morning to whom God has said what you are doing, that particular area of your life and Christian activity is not what you should be doing. And you may like, you may like Saul say, yes, that, that's true. But unless you are prepared to stop and to change, then you're the same as Saul. He said, I have played the fool, I have erred exceedingly. And later on, it's in the story, if I remember rightly, 1 Samuel 28, the story of how Paul, Saul, went to the witch at Endor. He said there, and who are we to contradict him? He said, God has departed from me. It's very very solemn. God has turned away from me and he answers me no more. But he didn't change. And this is why we are told here in 1 Chronicles chapter 10, this is why the people of God and the work of God were put to shame and were defeated. Not only the king, but the people under the king had broken faith with God. I sat in my study and pondered these things and knew that I had a solemn word to give you this morning. And I found myself thinking of the the verse of Scripture that we usually quote at weddings but it applies more widely. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. And then I found myself constrained to think about and to pass on to you the words of Jesus. I'm quoting from Matthew chapter 21 where Jesus, the Son of God, looked at certain men who were leaders among the people of God, as Saul was. And Jesus said, The kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a people who will bring forth the fruit of it. And so having looked at these first two lessons, both of them serious and solemn, and having in a sense anticipated the last verses of the chapter, 
I bid you in the chapter look back a little bit to the story of the men of Jabesh Gilead. Verse 11 and 12. It's an interesting insert into the story. Why, why is it here? Why, why did these brave warrior men amongst the people of Israel, why, why did they give this significant honor to King Saul? Why is this honor recorded in Scripture, even though Saul was a man disgraced and about to be forgotten? <clears throat> Why was it that it was these men of Jabesh Gilead, out of all the people of Israel, out of all the defeated armies of Israel, why did they do this thing? Well, of course, I had to go back in my Bible. We haven't time to read it this morning to the story in the first book of Samuel, chapter 11. Just round about the time when Saul was about to be made king. And the men, the people of Jabesh Gilead, were tyrannized by an enemy and they sought to make peace with the enemy. And the enemy said, yes, we'll make peace with you on this occasion, on this, on, on, on these terms that, that we are allowed to gouge out your eyes. And the men of Jabesh Gilead, facing that terrible humiliation and suffering, appealed for help. And Saul heard. He was largely unknown. But when he heard about this terrible thing that the enemy was about to do to the men of Jabesh Gilead, he rose up in righteous anger and he called for volunteers and he went and he delivered them from the enemy. And now at the end of his reign as king, publicly humiliated and rejected by God, these men of Jabesh Gilead remembered what Saul had done for them. They remembered what they owed to Saul. And out of gratitude, they took action and they risked danger, and they gave Saul and his sons an honorable burial. Perhaps as they did so, perhaps this was part of the reason why they did so. Perhaps they thought about Saul and thought of what he could have been had he not drifted away from God. And many a minister, if not every minister, looking back over his ministry can think of some and all oh, what they could have been but for the fact that they broke faith with God. Perhaps the men of Jabesh Gilead did this great thing, this, this honorable act because they pondered and thought that perhaps they may not have honored and helped Saul as they ought to have done during his life, and now it was too late to help him. Many a congregation has put up a memorial to a minister, but it's been a poor substitute for the help and the encouragement that they should have given when the man was ministering among them. Perhaps the men of Jabesh Gilead, as they did this rather honorable thing, thought to themselves, well, Saul may have led us wrongly, and yes, his influence has been bad for the nation, but who are we to condemn? And perhaps as they thought about it, they pondered and considered. And they thought about a man who suffered from his own dark, complicated personality. 
And the men of Jabesh Gilead said, We will not be bitter. We will honor him. And we will forgive him. Because God forgives us. And so in a word we come to the end of the chapter in these verses 13 and 14. The kingdom put into the hand of David the king. Ah, oh, but you say David was anointed as king by the prophet Samuel a long, long time before this. Yes, that's true. And David knew that he was the Lord's anointed. But his position and his potential had never yet been recognized or realized. He was the anointed king and yet he wasn't the king because Saul was there. But all through the story, this man David who knew that God's hand was upon him, refused to raise his hand against Saul. He said again and again, No, I will not touch the Lord's anointed. God put Saul there. And when God's time comes, God will take him away. And David, oh, people could say, Oh, well, but David, what, what, what about your life? What about your service? And David's answer would have been, That is in the hand of God. And David waited upon God. David humbled himself under God's mighty hand. David waited for God's time. And this, you see, was at the very heart of the message of the chronicler to the returned exile as they faced the future and a new stage of the work of God. This, this, was, this was the word of the chronicler from God to God's people, to this new generation at a new start. Look to God. Wait upon God. Trust God. In chapter 10, do right by God. Or else you put the whole future of the work in danger. And as you face the future, remember there is an enemy and prepare for spiritual warfare. Little wonder we are now going to sing, Soldiers of Christ, arise and put your armor on. Turn to hymn number 534. These marvelous words that are really a paraphrase of Scripture, Soldiers of Christ, arise and put your armor on, strong in the strength which God supplies through his eternal Son. Hymn number 534.